Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God, Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. First reading is a reading from the book of Isaiah. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn, and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication, and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The word of the Lord. Please read with me Psalm 36, 5 through 10 on the insert of your bulletin. I'll read to the asterisk and then you will follow. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. And your faithfulness to the gods. Your righteousness is like the strong mountains, your justice like the great deep. You say, you say you have have you have have you How priceless is your love, O God? They feast upon the abundance of your house. For with you is the well of life. Continue your loving kindness to those who know you. The second reading is a reading from the book of Corinthians. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. 
Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory be to you, Lord Christ. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guest had become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Thou hast kept the good wine until now. Someone once asked the noted concert pianist Jeffrey Siegel if there were portions of the repertoire he knew he ought to perform but was hesitant because perhaps he did not fully understand them. He answered in the affirmative and went on to say that the more he played these pieces, the harder they became, technically as well as interpretively, even though he knew deep down that he was performing them so much better. And his older colleagues told him that this was a sign not only of artistic, but emotional maturity. Theologically speaking, what Mr. Siegel had experienced was the concept of adoration. That is, the closer we come to God, the more wonderful we recognize him to be, yet at the same time we realize all the more how little we truly understand him. Rudolf Otto, in his seminal book, The Idea of the Holy, writes of the mysterium tremens, that endless mystery and fascination uh, that God or great examples of art and music exert upon us, things which we can never completely understand, yet when we try, even our feeble efforts and attempts can become infinitely rewarding. To arrive at this stage in our relationship with God is to practice the art of adoration. Adoration remains the highest type of prayer to which we might aspire to love God not because of what he will do or has done for us, but to love him simply because of who and what he is. Cardinal Henry Newman wrote that Epiphany is a season set apart, set apart especially for the adoration of the glory of Christ. In all other seasons, he writes, God does something. He is born, he suffers, rises from the dead, ascends into heaven, but in Epiphany, we celebrate him not on his field of battle or in his solitary retreat. We celebrate him as an august and glorious king. We behold him not just as an object of worship, but as the object of worship, which is what today's gospel is all about. Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed on him. To appreciate this gospel properly, we must avoid making either of two mistakes. If we read it too literally, Jesus might appear as 
simply a wonder-working vintner, the party saver, the reluctant rel rescuer of a, of a bridegroom's oversight to supply enough wine. Reading this chapter too literally can cause us to view God, view Jesus as God when we're in a pinch, or Jesus as the sommelier caterer extraordinaire, the Hebrew equivalent of Bacchus, giving us whatever we want, whenever we want. On the other hand, to consider this miracle at Cana as shrouded in a symbolic mist subverts the wonderfully human dimensions of the story. This is the way a Puritan might approach the situation. That is, the water doesn't really become wine or anything else intoxicating. Instead, it's some sort of divine non-alcoholic grape juice, which stands for the sweet new life that Jesus brings. This overly sanitized version uh, presents a sort of ethereal Jesus who glides into Cana a foot off the ground with his disciples behind him looking equally spiritual. How boring. This interpretation leaves little room for the Lord who arrives tired and thirsty after a three-day journey ready to relax and perhaps even kick up his heels a bit. I don't mean for a moment that the occasion is void of symbolism. John's gospel overflows with the symbolic. This is the first of Jesus' seven signs in this gospel. And biblical scholars refer to John's first 11 chapters as the book of signs. And signs always point to something, something other than what's on the sign. Think of a road sign signifying the left-hand curve up ahead. The sign points to the greater reality further up the highway. And by the way, the seventh sign comes in chapter 11 when Jesus raises, raises Lazarus from the dead. But this miracle, second thing, it takes place on the third day, always a reference to the resurrection. Further, the Jews used those six water pots for their rites of purification. Seven is the number of completeness and perfection. So John no doubt is telling us that those Jewish rituals simply aren't enough to deal with human sin. There are only six pots. The pots are empty. The water has already been spent, presumably having failed to accomplish the washing away of sin. Incidentally, each of these pots holds about 40 gallons of liquid, so we're talking about a whole lot of water and a whole, whole lot of wine. On March 25th, 1997, the Feast of the Annunciation, I was in Nazareth in the Church of the Annunciation with a tour group, and later that afternoon, we got on the bus and took the short drive to, drive, drive to um, Cana. And each of us there saw these water pots and were given a taste of the wine of Cana. And when we got back on the bus, we all kind of joked about how, given how horribly the wine of Cana tasted, the little wonder that the Lord decided to make his own. Um, anyway, last but not least, as regards the symbolic in this gospel. On Maundy Thursday, when John tells us that, Jesus, that Judas leaves the upper room and that it was night, by no account did John mean that it was dark outside. He was telling us the state of our empty souls. The fourth gospel overflows with the symbolic, and certainly right here. Nevertheless, here stands the Lord, exercising his vocation as nothing less than the agent of creation, reveling in that role, just as he would do in chapter 6 when he feeds the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Remember, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Shifting gears, it's not unusual to assume that this miracle is the only one Jesus performed which was not related to human need, as was the feeding of the 5,000. Yes, of course, we can state that the wedding feast was about to run dry, and yes, this might have been an embarrassment, but this feast, we can assume, had been going on for two or three days already, and rather safe as well to assume that everyone there had already had more than enough alcohol to consume. But back to adoration. If adoration means you and me 
simply loving Jesus in joy being himself, glorying in who and what he is, again, the agent of creation, the font of all goodness, truth, and beauty, then the wine, this very, very good wine becomes an epiphany or, an, or a manifestation of Jesus himself and his glory. We identify him as the good wine. And what a tremendous analogy this remains for you and me. Think of the beauty and richness inherent in a glass of wine. Not unlike our adoration of Jesus, so much of our enjoyment of wine comes not from drinking it, but in preparing ourselves to drink it, much less understand it before we understand it. Consider this. We read about it. I guess I'm talking about myself here somewhat. We read about it. We shop for it. We buy it. We store it, sometimes for years. We take it out of the cellar. We let it come to room temperature. We uncork it. We sniff the cork. We let it breathe. We decant it. We pour it into our glass. We gaze at its color. We swirl it. We admire its legs. We smell it. We even talk about it sometimes long before we take that first sip. We roll it around on our tongue and then we talk some more. As with our adoration of Jesus, our enjoyment of wine comes long before we ever really taste it, much less begin to understand it. I love to look at wine, especially if it's in a beautiful glass, and a good wine is much more attractive than an ugly one or a bad one. But this, is not, this wine is not just any wine. This is the good wine uppercase, which God has kept for you and me until the fullness of time, that is, until right now, the wine that maketh glad the heart of man. <clears throat> Apart from witnessing the birth of my children, a glass of wine, or for me at this point in my musical life, Anton Bruckner's Last Symphony, may be the closest examples I'll ever come in this life to that Mysterium tremens, that endless mystery and fascination of which Rudolf Otto writes. And as Jeffrey Siegel spoke of those difficult pieces in the piano repertoire, the more I listen to that last symphony, the more puzzled I am, the less I understand it, even though the more comforted I am as well as the more terrified I am, and all the while believing more and more that I could never ever live without it that pretty well sums up my own sense of the adoration of God. Now, <clears throat> to close, Jesus told his mother that when she told him the wedding was about to run dry, he remarked, woman, mind your own business. My hour is not yet come. The remark sounds disrespectful, snooty, and petulant, but in the Greek, it's anything but. He simply says that she must be patient, as must we, because he would be the one who would decide when his hour would come. The hour, of course, being the passion, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. Nevertheless, perhaps he thought it wouldn't hurt to leave this wedding reception with a little epiphany, a little taste of his kingdom and of himself. That, <clears throat> that noted theologian and author, Frederick Beekner, the Presbyterian one, yes, there is another one. God forbid if there are three of us out there. Um, he described this epiphany as follows. Quote, unfermented grape juice is a bland and pleasant enough drink, especially on a warm afternoon mixed half and half with ginger ale. But, it is a ghastly symbol of the lifeblood of Jesus, especially when served in individual, antiseptic, thimble-sized plastic containers. Wine is booze, which means it is dangerous and drunk-making. It makes the timid brave, 
and the reserved amorous. It loosens the tongue and breaks the ice, especially when served in a loving cup. It kills germs. As epiphanies go, it is a rather splendid one. Thou hast kept the good wine until now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the People, Form 6, found on page 392 in your Book of Common Prayer. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, and friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alive, for this community, the nation, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For all who proclaim the God, excuse me, I'm sorry. For the peace and the unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Frank, our bishop, and all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God. For the special needs of this congregation, particularly those on our prayer list, please, please pray for them either silently or aloud. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone, 
and so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. God's peace. Please be seated. Good morning. After that sermon, I'm somewhat hesitant to announce that this morning Due to COVID, we are only going to have communion in one kind. Um, hopefully, the Lord will forgive us. On Thursday, our COVID number in town was 135, and last summer, uh, the highest it ever got to was 99. Um, so obviously, it's going up very fast. Fortunately, uh, their Archbold is holding out pretty pretty well. Uh, not too many people in, in, in ICU. And on Friday, the number went from 135 to 135.35. So that's encouraging because the previous days had taken, uh, it gone up le by leaps and bounds. So um, I hope and pray that maybe this is a signal that uh, we're reaching that apex and, and, and it's going to drop back down. But uh, obviously for everyone's safety this morning, we are going to do communion. In, in one kind. Uh, there will be no children's program this Wednesday night, although uh, there will be the service of Holy Eucharist here in the chapel at six. Uh, Wallace will celebrate the confession of St. Peter at that time. Another important uh, landmark, next Saturday morning is Susan Gage's ordination to the priesthood. That event will take place at St. Barnabas in Valdosta at 11 a.m. I think it was previously announced at 10 a.m., but it's at, it's at 11 a.m. If anyone is planning to go, if you've never been to St. Barnabas before, it's not much bigger than our chapel. So I would advise you to get there by 10 o'clock, seriously, if you want a seat, certainly no later than, than, than 10.15. Two weeks from today, June 30th, is our annual meeting, and Jonathan Ariel and Joe McElreath have consented to stand for vestry. Uh, God willing, with the congregation's uh, consent, they will be uh, elected to the vestry at that time. So please put that on your calendar. Um, Joe and Sharon McElreath are hosting the coffee hour today. We are thankful to them for that. And it's hard for me to tell with the, with the mask, but if we have any guests this morning, please know you're welcome and please uh, know that you're most invited and welcome to join us for coffee hour in the parish following the service. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven.
things come of thee, O Lord, and of thy womb have we given thee. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and at the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us be pleased. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be amongst you, and remain with you this day and always.